Psalm 18, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made the darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of waters were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put, my, put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, and according to the cleanness of mine hands in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. With the forward thou wilt show thyself forward. forward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down high looks. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon, setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken in mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid of their close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. 
It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praise unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. Now that mantra has gone out, and I hear it all the time, and everyone's signing off their phone calls and signing off uh, a salutation when you meet them in the marketplace or wherever. Everyone's saying, stay safe, stay safe, stay safe. I hear it constantly. It's at my workplace. It's... It's in the grocery store, it's, it's, it's in the streets. Stay safe. There's no safer space than in the will of God. And here in Psalm 18, it begins with that statement where it says, I will, and I love those, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now we got to choose to love God. I will, that's a decision that's being made here by the psalmist. And we hear David often say that. Almost as if every morning he convinces himself and talks to himself and says, I will follow the Lord. I will serve the Lord. I will do that which is right in his sight. I will choose to love him today. I will appoint him the proper place. And the proper place of God is that he is your strength. Give him your trust. Give him your faith. Believe on him today. Choose to love him. Verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. And whom will I trust? My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. He's our rock. He's, he's solid and he's sure and, and naturally so. Nothing's more natural than a rock that was created and formed and, 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 and is, just, is just there. And it's solid and it's, it's, it's surety of all things. He's our rock. He's our fortress. He's something that's built round about us. Something that that when, when we're inside, we're in safety. When we're outside, there's danger. When you're in Christ, he's built round about you. He is your fortress. David here says, and I believe that, he's the deliverer. In other words, he, he brings you up out of things. He delivers you. He carries you. He, he, he picks you up and brings you to another position. He, he's the deliverer. We were doomed, and now we are saved. He's delivered us from death and from hell. My God, I love that. My God, he's, he's personal. He, he's specifically mine, and he's yours as well if you've trusted him today. He's a personal God. He's not, he's not some ominous presence or, or some, some spirit or some force. No, he's, he's a personal God. Make him your own. Believe on him and trust him. But also choose to accept the fact that he belongs to you and you to him. My strength is brought up here. My strength meaning he's my comfort. He's my help. He's my sustainer. He, he's, he's the one that allows for me to go on. My buckler, that's the, the, the indication of him as a defender. He goes with us. The buckler was just a, a little shield that was, was kept upon the arm. It was lightweight. It was, it was manageable. You could take it wherever with you. Take the name of Jesus with you. He's your buckler. He's that, he's that shield that will defend you. Specifically your core, your heart, your being. He's your salvation. Not only in this life and from hell. And eternal. But he, he, he's, your, he's your salvation here from the troubles that you go through. And he's your salvation there when you cross over, when you die and leave this world. He's your high tower. I like this as well. It means he's your vantage point. It means he's your foresight. When you have the highest of towers, you can see the enemy coming. You can see troubles and, and strife that's in the horizon. You can see the trouble that's before you. Also, those troubles will have difficulty getting to you. God's your high tower, then, then he gives you the vantage point. He gives you the advantage then over your enemies and over those that would come after you. In verse 3 it says, He is worthy. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And God is worthy of all of our praise and all of our love and all of our worship. Not only because he's all those things to us, but just by nature of who he is in general, God deserves the praise and worship of all. Those that he is, he is blessing and living life through, and those that have rejected him long ago. 
He'll get praise from them all in the end. Verse 4, it says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. These sorrows of death, the sorrow of hell, we're so far removed from that if we would just believe that. Yes, these floods of ungodly men can make us afraid. So far, we've seen that, that, that fear has been the major driving factor that men have been using against us to make us, make us afraid, make us doubtful, make us not trusting in God. And though these things come upon us, God provides a way out. You read verse 6. It says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Now, what do you do when you're in distress? In this last few weeks, there's been many things to be distressed about, to be concerned about, to be, uh, to be, to be worried about. In our stress, in our distress, when our problems, when life of sorrows of death and sorrows of hell, when men are wickedly, ungodly coming after us to drive us to fear, when there's snares all around us that want to trap us and trip us up in this life, we got to be like David, that in that distress, we call upon the Lord. The Bible talks regarding the last days in Luke chapter 21. It says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after the things which are coming upon the earth. And I see that so often that, that, that men, for fear, are, are, are falling. They're failing. They look to the things that are coming and they begin to imagine what is next. And, and, and they'll make in their own minds a scenario that is far worse than what is actually in front of us. Maybe because they've heard an evil report from overseas. Or maybe they're beholding the evil report that is just being pumped into the homes through the television. No wonder men's hearts are failing them. But Luke 21 and 26 is very late in the tribulation period. In fact, it's right before Jesus comes where men's hearts are failing them. And yet now we already see it. And I've been, I've been shocked to find how fast fear can grip people. I've been surprised to see how fast fear can grip me if I start to turn away from looking at Jesus and start to watch the news and the YouTube documentaries and the, and, and, and the reports of, of my, my brethren and my peers. No wonder men's hearts fail them, but in my distress I need to look first to Him. Call upon the Lord. Amen. The Bible says, in my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of His temple. And my cry came before Him even unto His ears. So we have access to God's inner temple. We have access to God's very ears by simply crying unto Him. I talked earlier about how we are of more value. We are the most value. God's not going to hear the multitude, but He was, and He is willing to and desires to engage with us, to hear our voice, to hear our cry. And yet too often we're silent when we should be speaking with God. Verse 7 said, Then... So this is after the voice comes to God. This is after into his ears comes the cry of his saint. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Now we need to make no mistake here. And understand that there is oppression coming upon us. Whether we, whether we look at it as significant or insignificant, whether we think it's a very big deal or not, we have been oppressed by those that rule over us. They have given, their, their idea of solving a problem is by oppressing their own people. Okay? Now when, when these troubles and anguish come upon us, when distress comes upon us, when we're attacked seemingly by a flood of ungodly men, we need to turn to God because if you call upon him, his wrath gets revealed in a big way. God loves you. God will protect you. God will watch over you. And even if I'm just feeling oppressed, if I call upon him, I can trust the righteous judge to dish out the necessary amount of wrath to solve this situation. 
I may think that the, literally the chains of hell are upon me, and God might say, ah, that's just a mosquito buzzing around your ear. But if I call upon him, he'll make that righteous judgment, do the appropriate amount of his own wrath upon the scenario and upon those that are oppressing me, and upon the problem, in order to bring things back to where I can be comforted and feel safe and feel secure in my life. God loves and he will defend his own. Verse 8, it says, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. So this scenario, obviously, is, is a dire one. This is one where David literally feels that ungodly men are compassing him about, and the snares of traps are laying wait. And if we were to behold how it's being portrayed in the news media, the same is true. Like, like their, our brother over here said, he, he, he recorded that, basically they're saying that even if you're out in the public and talking amongst two or three or, or gathered, you, you can, you can that's, that's a trap for you that's been laid already. You can succumb to that thing. Whatever your interpretation, let's look at what David's experience. This seems to be much worse, I believe, than what we're experiencing today, but let's grab principles from it. When he cried in his distress unto the Lord, the Bible says that the earth shook. The foundations also of the hills moved. It says there was a smoke come up out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth devoured. God's angry here. Verse 9 says, he bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed. Hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens. And the highest gave his voice. Hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. And he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. If you could, you can go to Luke chapter 21. Keep your finger there in Psalm 18 and Luke 21. Luke 21 and verse 25, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. If you were to read in Matthew 24, it says at this time, immediately after the tribulation, the sun and moon are dark and the moon does not give its light. All of these things happening while men's hearts are failing them for fear and for looking upon these things that are coming to the earth. Luke here implores us to look up for your redemption is drawn nigh. And Matthew says, then shall he gather his elect from one end of heaven unto the other. Now what we are seeing today in regard to the sun and moon being darkened, in regard to God's fiery wrath coming out, in regard to the breath of his nostrils sending a blast at the earth, in regard to the, the, the sorrows of death and of hell that are coming upon this earth as it shakes and trembles and moves about. What we're experiencing today pales in comparison to what's coming, but what we're seeing today is there, I believe, to alert us to what is coming, to, to draw to our attention to what is just on the horizon. Look at verse 29, it says, And he spake unto them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. 
And so when we see things biblically that the scriptures align or indicate would be end times things, that is as if when a fig tree shoots out its branches or when any tree starts to get buds upon it, let's say. We look at it and now we know that summer is nigh. And so when we look at the nations being distressed, when we look at the pestilences increasing, the earthquakes increasing, when we look at men's hearts failing them for fear, we can likewise discern that summer is nigh or discern that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And for each one of us, it's nigher every day. It's closer every day. If we're to all believe that perhaps we have a day, amount of days that are numbered. Well, that's what God says. As our very hairs of our head are, so are our days numbered. Continuing on, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass, verse 33. But my words shall not pass away. And so... If we're to put our faith and our trust in anything in this life, it's got to be in the word that does not pass away. This heaven, this earth will pass, will end, will be done away with one day when God sees fit. But his word never will be. And so you can mark it. You can take those promises as true and as long lasting. Back in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 16, it said, He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. And that's just an interesting passage of scripture there because David, as he often does prophetically in the Psalms, talks about things he's experiencing presently, but they often indicate a, a greater truth that is in the future. And here David, after he's talking about smoke coming out of God's nostrils, fire, out of his, it talks about God's wrath beginning to, I believe, build up. By verse 15, you're seeing the blast blast of the breath of his nostrils coming upon the foundations of the world as they're being rebuked. And so God's wrath is here just on the doorstep, beginning and initiating by God's people calling him out to him. And then it says there in verse 16, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. If you were to just look across in verse 4, it says, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So what I see here is a little prophetic picture of the rapture that we just saw when we were looking at Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24 in another place. He took me, drawing me out of many waters. What was David's problem back in verse 4? The floods of ungodly men, the many waters that were surrounding him. And yet David found the opportunity, he found God just in the nick of time, coming and taking him, sending from above and calling him. That's even as is promised in 1 Thessalonians, where it says in verse 14 of chapter 4, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, and that's what's sure, and that's what's established, and that's what abideth forever, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Didn't the Bible say he sent from above? He came from above. The Lord descended from heaven with a shout. He sent and took his people with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so this is primarily in the context to come for the mourners. The Thessalonian church was under heavy persecution. They were a godly church. They were a righteous church. They were a church of strong believers, but they had faced such persecutions that they thought to themselves, we're in the last days, surely. And yet the assurance here is that while you have lost so many loved ones, and while you are facing such persecutions, the comfort that you need to realize, and that you need to embrace, and you need to grab a hold of, is the fact that the Lord is coming again. And when He comes... He is not going to just leave those in the dirt while you rise to be with him. No, he is not going to allow you to go before them 
Rather, they will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort yourself with these words. Even as the Thessalonians, in regard to their mourning hearts for their lost loved ones and wanting to see them again, and the pain that they had experienced from having the tribulation time upon them and the struggles and the strife and the hurts and the hardships, even among all that, they could grab comfort from the fact that Christ is coming. And we need to also apply that same truth today. Look, we can't just blanket promise everybody that tomorrow is going to be better. But, but the tomorrow that is beyond, the tomorrow that is after we die, whether we're put in the earth and Christ raises us first to be with Him, or whether we're alive and remain unto His coming, either way, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the good news. That's the silver lining upon all of this. All of this life. Look, whether we're dealing with just paying bills and, and, and a boss that's difficult and being hard on us, or we're dealing with relational issues, or we're dealing with a virus, all of those things are hard in this life. And all of those things, when we look to Christ and to beyond the, the time when we will ever be with the Lord, all of our struggles now pale in comparison to the glory that will one day be revealed with us, in us. Back in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 17, the Bible says, He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. David's realizing here that the enemy is too strong for him. He's not going to be able to overcome the enemy. The enemy is too strong, but for the delight of the God of heaven that is upon him, he can overcome. He delivered me from my enemy and from them which hated me. He prevented me in the day of my calamity. And so when we're concerned with what's going on in the world, we need to understand that God is over all of these things. God is in control of all these things. Our enemy, maybe the virus, is too strong for us to overcome on our own. Right? But we can stay safe by being in Christ, by trusting upon Him. Verse 20 it says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of mine hands hath He recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And I did put, I did not put away his statutes from me. The Bible here talks about the ways of the Lord being before us. And not departing from our God. We do have an enemy that is strong. Flesh, sin, you name it, right? But Christ is stronger still. But the thing is, is that we need to be in a position where we're putting His righteousness first. That's what it says here. All His judgments were before me. I did not put away His statutes from me. So David, in a time when he was struggling with a powerful enemy, did not use that as an excuse to put from himself his Lord, to put from himself the ways of his God, to somehow do wickedly in his sight. Rather, he put the righteousness of God's first. The Bible says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And I believe we all need to keep this in perspective here because the tendency is, is that when we face an enemy that is stronger than us, that is an outward enemy, that is a problem that is, that is beyond our control and beyond our ability to solve, we start to focus more on the problem and less on the Savior. And we start to do more to fight against the concern than we do after falling after Christ. What I'm saying is that te tendency is, is that we forget the fact that our flesh is still the biggest challenge and the biggest struggle point that we'll ever face. When we do that, Christ's righteousness becomes second. Sin creeps in. And next thing you know, we're in Aiken troubling the house. Now this is the thing we need to focus on, and I need to focus on myself. We're here, and we're, we're, 
we're, we're here by all intents and, and it's, it's not according to Sum's law, okay? We don't want to give the world reason to come in and to stop us. Do you remember Achan? Do you remember how he troubled the whole camp because he brought his idol into here? He brought his sin into the camp. And so we all need to be cautious because one Achan can spoil the whole congregation. And that was the case. Until Achan was out, the congregation suffered from plague, suffered from turmoil, suffered from not winning the battles against the visible, powerful enemy. Now is not the time to put away the ways of the Lord and depart from your God and to remove from his judgments and to step away from his statutes. Now is the time to, as it says in verse 23, I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. His judgments need to be before us more than ever. More than ever, we need to be following after keeping God's commands and doing God's will. Because when we don't, we set ourselves up for failure. We're doing right by coming to church. I believe that. But if we come to church with the wrong spirit, with sins in our lives, we could be the one that comes in and troubles the whole camp and causes this church a world of hurt and a world of harm. Ourselves a world of hurt and a world of harm. Where God wants to bless us and he wants to keep us safe and he wants to love us and protect us. One sinner destroyeth much good. And that could be the end result if we're not careful to keep all of God's judgments and statutes and ways before us. And we're not careful to keep after the things of God. We have his judgments before us. We don't need to worry about then the world's plans and plots and charts and graphs. We can have peace and we can be cleansed if we're just in the scriptures. We're not going to get our way out of this scenario, in this situation of ourselves. God's going to have to do it. That, that's, that's the bottom line of all this. As David does here, we have an enemy that is too strong for us. Whether it's the disease or whether it's the government. Whether, whatever it is. It's too strong for us. We've got to be clean in his sight, though, if we want God to do as he's promising here. Verse 24 says, Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. Okay, we're clean in his sight by soul and by spirit. But by flesh, if we choose to walk in the flesh, we can still be filthy. We can still have, have tainting, taintedness on us. We can still have issues that would cause for God to withhold his blessing from us. But if we walk in the light, if we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And therefore, body, soul, and spirit, glory to God, we can be clean in his sight. We can be clean before him according to my righteousness that is emboldened and empowered by the fact that above all, I am righteous before him because I have Christ's righteousness upon me. Basically, what God's outlining here is that we will reap what we sow. If we reap to the flesh corruption, we're going to have problems. Okay? We can do right in the position of assembling as a church and getting out there and go soul winning and have God give opportunity to the enemy to take us out because our home life is not in order. And we're doing wrong things in our house. And we're, reading, we're looking at wrong things in our private quarters. When we're, when we're, when we're, when we're, doing the wrong things and playing with the wrong things and watching the wrong things. It can give opportunity for the enemy to basically punch a hole in our, our armor. We need to be mindful of the things of God more so at this time. Now's not the time to be loose in the things of God. Now's the time to tighten them up. Do greater works. We will reap what we sow. Sow to the Spirit and yield incorruptible fruit. Sow to the flesh yield corruptible fruit. Verse 25, I like this. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. How you show yourself is how God's going to treat you. That brings even more weight to the treat others as you like to be treated. Treat others as you would like God to treat you. How about that? 
That's, that makes it even more serious and even more pivotal that we would treat others well, that God would treat us well. Show mercy that God would give mercy. Be pure that God would show himself pure to us. And with the forward, thou wilt show thyself forward. We should be pure. We should be upright. We should be merciful as believers in a time like this. As the world remains forward, which is habitually disposed to disobedience, always tending towards opposition and even so proud of it, that's got to be the opposite, as far from the Christian as possible. If you have a tendency that when God says thou shalt, your tendency is to be in opposition to it, it's time to get that right now. Because again, I believe that those that are going to do exploits are going to be those that are walking the straight and narrow. I think we can set ourselves up for failure if we're not minding the things of God now and, 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 and being careful about what we're sowing so that we don't reap later. Look, I just bought some tomato seeds. I plan to put those tomatoes in there. I'm going to sow tomato seeds, and then in a few months, I'm going to reap tomatoes. Okay? It takes time sometimes. And this is the problem with us in sin, is we think we're going to plant a little bit of sin, and then we don't see any consequence. So we're like, oh, that's okay. I got away with it. So we'll plant some more sin, and plant some more sin, and plant some more sin. And here, right now, things aren't that bad in this world, right? But think about three months from now, once the season of harvest comes, and those seeds of sin that you have planted today start to grow up into incorruptible fruit. Now you've got a problem. The world's now worse, and you've got a whole bunch of sin to pay for, consequentially, in this life. Now's the time to tighten things up. Have his judgments before you. Have his statutes before you. Seek after his righteousness. So good and righteousness and positive things into your life now. Start making good habits. And not always being habitually disposed to just be disobedient to God as he commands you things. Verse 27 says, For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And here's a promise of salvation and enlightenment. God here says that he will save the afflicted people, those that are going through affliction and struggles. He's desiring to save them and to help them and to, and to bring them through these things. He's also desiring to enlighten your darkness, to be that candle in your life. So when you think things are, are, are beyond you understanding, you're so confused about what's going on, and you don't know what to do next, just start doing what you know to do. Because God is planning on on months ahead how he's going to order your life and so if you are taking steps of obedience now then down the line the candle will be lit you'll be enlightened out of your darkness you'll see things as they are supposed to be crystal clear and at that time you will have fruit growing based on what you planted way back here this is why the christian life is always in cycles and in seasons we need to understand that what we're planting now we are going to reap later Yet yeah, we're always so short-sighted. We don't realize the consequence, the long-term consequence that our sins have upon us. And it's so much more important, I believe, now. God wants to save us. He wants to give us enlightenment. But we've got to believe on Him, trust Him, and we've got to do what He says. Keep His statutes before you. Verse 29. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God I have leaped over a wall. By Him great exploits are promised. Think about that, leaping over a wall. A leap is just kind of like a, woo, it's just a, a, just a free little hop, right? Over a wall. I don't care if it's a little wall. I don't leap over them, right? If I try to leap, I'm going to face plant, right? The high jump back in the day, right? The best thing about the high jump was that the bar fell down. It wasn't secure. Otherwise, I would have wrecked myself so many times because I couldn't just leap over it like some people could. But God here promises that by him... You can leap over a wall. And I love this. Run through a troop. A great mass of people that, according to David, he says were the ones that were trying to trap him. Floods of ungodly men trying to destroy him. A troop. A gathering of people that are gathered against the believer. And David says, by you, Lord, I've run through them. I've gotten through them. I've come out on the other side safe. Exploits were done by God. 
Verse 30 says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. It's undeniable here that God is promising that his way is right always. The word is tried and true. It's never steered anyone wrong. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him, believe in him. He'll go with you. He'll show the way and he'll be the word that guides you all through these things. Verse 31, for who is God, save the Lord, and who is a rock, save our God. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. All glory to him. When I say we need to be keeping his statutes before us and his judgments before us and living righteous life so that we can sow righteousness now and reap righteousness later, I'm doing that from the perspective that it's still not our works. It's by God and through God that we get the strength and we're made perfect. We're following his way. We're following his statutes. We're following his judgments. And that's the safest place for any believer to be. It's the safest place for anybody to be, is to be in the will of God. Verse 33 says, He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon my high places. I love this. High places. You think of mountains when they get up into the into the heights, the jagged rocks, the treacherous territory. But the other side of it is that as a high place, you're elevated. You're at the pinnacle. You're set up on high. You're a little bit closer to heaven. So God's bringing us closer to heaven. He's setting us up on high places. He's, he's, he's elevating us. He's lifting us up. At the same time, he's setting our feet down upon treacherous places, and that can be concerning because once you start walking in the ways of God, God's going to put you in more treacherous places, believe it or not. Why? Because now he can trust you to get through them. But he's not just going to leave you there. All the while, he's going to be your shield, your rock, your strength, making your way perfect, and even this, making your feet like hind's feet. Or like those rams that are way up there in the cup. They walk with such assurance and such confidence. Go watch some of those rams. that you, they, got these, they got these kind of circular round feet. You wouldn't think they'd be able to climb a thing. And they're climbing like vertical cliffs. Hopping around like it's nothing. Up in the mountains. Assurance. With the promise of God. They have nothing to worry about. So God takes you, sets you up on high, puts you in treacherous territory, puts the world against you, puts floods of ungodly men against you, puts pestilences before you, gives you all sorts of roadblocks that would challenge you, that would make things hard, and then gives you hinds feet in those high places, in that treacherous term, so that you can jump about and not even have a moment or a lapse of confidence and assurance in the fact. We can walk where no man has walked before, even as these hinds leap about in those high places. We can be safe there. Why? Because we're trusting in God and obeying his word. Trust and obey, there's no other way. I mean, I'm a broken record up here, aren't I? Verse 34, he teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. It's excessive, isn't it? You got a bow that you're going to use to defeat the enemy, and you're you're so strong, strengthened by God, that you just snap the thing in half. A bow of steel is broken in my arms. It's excessive. In other words, you've got strength to spare, you've got wisdom to spare, you've got you've got love to spare, you've got purity to spare, you've got you've got wisdom and understanding and knowledge that surpasses. You've gotten strength. You're able to war beyond what is even necessary through God. Who what? Maketh your feet like hinds feet. Who girdeth you with strength and makes your way perfect. Who is that shield and buckler that proves that his way is perfect before you and gives you the steps to get in there. It's always by faith. I keep saying, I, I, was, I, I was just talking the other day to somebody that, that wanted an end to this and wanted to know how they could, how they could get through this and, and, and all that kind of thing. And people are doubting and people are worried. And I said, I can't teach people faith. I've been preaching faith and faith and believe and trust, believe and trust. It's a, I, I get it. It's, it's a broken record doctrine for me. But it's so important. You can't be taught faith. But... You grow in faith by what? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So get in your Bible and read your Bible and trust that your Bible will give you more faith. Amen. And also, you got to go through some things. 
To be set up on high, you got to understand you're being put in treacherous territory. And we're pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And each level, each, each, each step we take is going to have more challenges and more difficulties and more struggles. But you know what? You're going with a God that's going to make you so strong that even the tool that you need to protect and defend yourself will just break in your hands. He's, going to, he's a God that will make you so strong that he'll give you the feet to be able to walk on the treacherous territory that is before you. He sets you up there, but he doesn't leave you there alone. Because he goes and leads the way. And if you trust in him, he's your buckler. If you trust in him, he's your strength. If you trust in him, he's your fortress, your rock, your deliverer, your salvation, your very high tower. He's all these things to those that believe in him. Be safe. You know what they say? Be safe. Stay safe. Go into your house and hide. God says, stay safe. Hey. Come with me and let me put you at the top of a mountain. Let me, let me put you where no man's ever walked before. Let me set you on treacherous ground. Let me put a troop in front of you. Let me put pestilence in front of you. Let me put disease in front of you. Let me put poverty in front of you. Let me put all these things that are going to attack the very faith that I want you to grow in. Let me do this and then carry you through it. No safer place to be but where God puts you and where God sustains you and where God builds you. Verse 34, he teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Ultimately, that's our greatest defense. You know, they threaten the body. You know, don't threaten me with a good time. You're going to kill me and send me to heaven? Okay. That's the ultimate shield. That's the ultimate defense. And thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Now, we hear about God here as with, with, with like smoke coming out of his nostrils and fire coming down and earthquakes and, sh and, and the world shaking. We read about him in the last days as, as peeling back the sky and the fire and brimstone coming down, the very words of his mouth that he spoke men into existence. He's speaking them out of existence. We see God as this great and terrible being. And here it talks about his gentleness is what makes us great. What makes the believer great is, is the care and compassion he has for you. Look, we're all going to get rocked in the next couple days. But just take comfort in the fact that God is being very gentle with us. He's giving us one little step of faith at a time, working us up to the point by his right hand that is holding us up, by the strength of his very... Uh, his very self, you know, his right hand is, is an indication of who he is. He's holding you up with, like, with that and being gentle as he leads you along. Verse 37 says, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. Verse 36, thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. Remember back in verse 17, he said, he said, He delivered me from my strong enemy, from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Those that were too strong for David, the problem that was too strong for David, the danger and fear that was before him that should have overtaken him, is now fleeing from him. He's overtaking them. He's turned the battle to the gates. He's, he's turned again, and he did not turn back until they were consumed. He's wounding them. They're not able to rise. They're now fallen under his very feet. Why? Because he is trusting in God to get him through these things. He's leaning on the Lord. He's allowing the Lord to carry him through that. They were too strong but now God has stepped in and without remedy put them to task. 
Verse 39, for thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. God is doing a great work here in a man that was pressed against the wall's life. A man that had nothing that he could do to escape from this situation. A man that was, would have been ruined in the natural world is now having supernatural miracles carry him through. God without remedy has now turned the tables. The enemies are destroyed and that they hated God's people. He gives them strength to conquer. He gives David strength to conquer. Verse 41. They cried, but there was none to deliver, none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as dirt in the streets. Without remedy, they are destroyed. Even, even calling upon, they, they think that it's the Lord was some magic word. And I believe that's going to happen at the end of the days. Men that are believing and trusting in God, doing great exploits, standing on high places with hinds feet, doing great exploits in the name of God. Men are going to see and just think that God is just some magic genie that if they call unto him, he's going to hear and do the same thing for them. They cried, yes, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord. But he answered them not, though he's attentive to our cry and ready to jump in and save us by his wrath in a moment. Then did I beat them as small as the dust in the wind. I did cast them out as dirt in the streets. There's our strength to conquer. Verse 44, as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The stranger shall submit themselves unto me. The stranger shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. Here's the strength to overcome and to ultimately rule. We shall rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Those that once hated us will be destroyed, and some of them will even remain and submit themselves unto us. And I love that. That's just an interesting phrase there at the end. They'll be afraid out of their closed places. They fade away, and they're afraid out of their closed places. In other words, the places where they've hid themselves, the places where they were hiding away from the Lord, where they were in great fear of the destruction that was coming. The closed places is not the place for the believer. It's not our place to be hiding. It's not our place to be sheltering away. Sure, there is the prudent man that foreseeth the evil and hide from himself. There's a time and place for that. You know, God will give us discernment for that. But Christians aren't to be just constantly in fear and in closed places. Read through the Bible, you'll find constantly God set us in an open place, a large place, great spaces, expanse, at the top of a mountain with hinds feet upon us. He setteth you up there. We, we, we shouldn't be hiding. We shouldn't be ashamed. We should be as a candle set upon a hill. Giveth light to all. Notice the world's afraid of their close places. They're saying, oh, stay safe. We'll stay home. Look at verse 46. The Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praise unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth his mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. The world keeps saying, stay safe and hide away, stay safe and hide away. God is living. God is active. God is ready to work through us. He's delivering us from our enemies. He's lifting us up above those that are rising up against us. He's delivering us from those violent men that would hurt us. He's delivering us from all fears and all troubles and all strife and all turmoils. Therefore, among the heathen, we can sing and praise his name for all that he has done for us. Again, the safest place to be is with the living God and in his will doing his works, following his way. If you look across in Psalm 20, beginning in verse 5, it says, We will rejoice in thy salvation. In the name of our God will we set up our banners. In other words, when, when you have a banner, like when you have this, it, this is to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's up there to, 
for all to see. Hold fast. Right? It's a banner. Okay? We rejoice in the salvation. In the name of our God will we set up our banners. In other words, I'm saved. This is my banner. It's there for everybody to see. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. Do you know that today? You may know that you have eternal life and you believe that with all your heart. Do you know that the Lord saveth his anointed? You will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Do you know also that God is there and willing and wanting to, to hear and to save by the strength of his right hand? What, what, is, what is safer than to be in the will of God, asking your will of him, who is desiring to save you with the strength of his right hand? I mean, why do we fear what men shall do to us? Why do we fear what sickness shall do to us? Why do we fear death and what that will do to us? Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And that's not just Jesus. His name is his reputation. His name is who he is. His name is his promise. His name is the word. Some are going to trust in their chariots and in their horses. Some are going to trust in their, in their separation from other sick people. Some are going to trust in ventilators. Some are going to trust in, in their 401k. Some are going to trust in the bank. Some are going to trust in their jobs. We are going to trust and remember the name of the Lord, his reputation, his promises made to us. In the end, they are brought down and fallen. Who? Those that have trusted in chariots. Those that have trusted in horses and all these things of the world. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. We can stand only because we're trusting in God. And in his name, we put our remembrance. Save, Lord. Let the king hear us when we call. Amen and amen. Call unto him, ask him, seek him in these times. More and more each day, look to his word, follow his, his guidance. I mean, as you read even the Psalms, just, just more and more they're speaking to me, you can see of God's providence, God's care, God's strength, God's might towards those that follow and believe and trust in him. We're going to see great exploits. Believe on him that he can do it. That's all God asks for is some faith. Faith is a mustard seed can grow into a ginormous plant carry you through it. You don't need to worry. You don't need to be scared. You don't need to let the sorrows of death compass you about. You don't need to let the truth make you afraid. Those floods of ungodly men. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. And so I believe God wants to do that with us today. Take us. Draw us out of our troubles. And use us according to his will. Because he delighted in us.